Good morning. It is so good to see you in the house of the Lord, and thank you for joining us via our live stream services. Today, I want to speak about get ready for the overflow. Church, I believe God's preparing his people for a mighty move of God in these last days. You know, in the book of Joshua, the book about conquering and possessing, the Israelites were entering into the promised land, which overflowed with good things. As you read the language that Moses uses, He's talking about a land flowing with milk and honey. Matter of fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 10, it says, It is a large land, prosperous cities that you did not build. The, the houses will be richly stocked with goods that you did not produce. You will draw water from cisterns you did not dig, and you will eat from vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. When you have eaten your fill in this land, be careful not to forget the Lord who rescued you from uh, slavery in the land uh, of Egypt. Now, as you know, the Israelites spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness because of their disobedience. The journey from Egypt to Israel, the land of promise, was just a few days' journey for them. But the journey turned into a wilderness experience because of the actions of a few which led the mass of Israel to disobey the Lord. And as Israel is preparing to enter the promised land, long after a wilderness experience, the Lord gives this warning in verse 12. Be careful not to forget the Lord who rescued you from the slavery in the land of Egypt. Let me remind us today, in the midst of the overflow which is to come, the abundance of God, of his blessings, we must not forget the Lord Jesus Christ. We must not forget what we were. We used to live in bondage, but now we are free. We must always remember where we came from. Preparing for the overflow. Getting ready. Now, before the Israelites entered into the overflow, the promise, there was a wilderness experience. Now, let me correlate this to today. In a very real sense, we as a nation, as a world, as the people of God, we are in a wilderness experience. But I refuse to see doom and gloom before us. I believe God is going to use this. What the powers of darkness have meant to cripple humanity, I believe that God is going to bring us into a time of overflow, to a time of abundance. I believe souls are going to be saved. People are going to be set free. Addicts are going to be delivered. And marriages are going to be restored. Why? Because God is going to send an overflow of his spirit to the church once again. Can somebody give God praise? I believe God is going to use this experience. I'm reminded of that great verse in Psalm 30, verse 5. The new King James says, For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for the night, but guess what? Joy comes in the morning. The psalmist was reminding himself that in the midst of the hardship, there may be some tears being shed, but, but be encouraged because with the breaking of the dawn uh, comes joy. And church, we might be walking through the wilderness 
at this moment, but God's getting ready to break forth. God's getting ready to do something, and joy is coming in the morning. Now, what is interesting about Psalm 30 is it's a part of the Thanksgiving Psalms. But Psalm 30 is talking about the chastening of the Lord. One theologian writes this, from his experience of deliverance, from God's chastening for his sin, David praised the Lord because his anger is temporary, but his favor is permanent. Look at verse 11 of Psalm 30. You've turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. See, the sobering truth is that David, a spiritual man that he was, had carelessly allowed his spiritual building to fall into a state of disrepair. He leaves no doubt about the case at all. In verse 6, he said this, In my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. He had become intoxicated with his own success. Perhaps it was the building of the splendid palace that made David forget that the God who gave him all his blessings could with a mere breath remove them. David thought that he could not be moved, but God showed him that he could. And church, it's important that when we're experiencing a time of blessing, that we do not forget the goodness of God, that we do not forget it's not our own talents that have brought the blessings, it's the favor of the Lord our God. Could it be that we are in a wilderness experience because humanity has forgotten from whom her blessings come from? Her blessings come from the creator of the heavens and the earth. Could this not be a time where you and I will refocus upon what is important and that's God the Father and knowing him through God the Son and being filled with God the Holy Spirit that we might be used for the kingdom of God. This man, David, is experiencing chastisement. Now, is it not remarkable to find it among the Psalms of Thanksgiving? When was the last time you thanked God for his chastening? When was the last time you thanked God for the hardship, the pain? That those who do not understand chastisement will consider it impossible to give thanks for it. But for those who have dug into the matter, discipline is the father of love pursuing his child's good. Did you hear me? Discipline is the father of love pursuing his child's good. And you will rejoice as much as David rejoiced. Why? Because you realize the chastening only lasts for a moment, but his favor will last for life. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy is coming in the morning. Church, when I look at our great nation, I don't see dark gloom, despair, and agony on me. Yes, things are dark. Yes, things are difficult, but I see God working and moving. I see the possibilities before us, and I believe God is going to shower his blessings upon his church once again look at your neighbor and say neighbor get ready for the overflow get ready for the manifestation the power of God like never before you received your notes when you came in the first fill in the blank let's talk about the river of God let's go to another psalm psalm 65 verse 9 I shared this psalm about three years ago. Verse 9, it says, you take care of the earth and water it, making it rich and fertile. The river of God has plenty of water. Did you hear that? 
The river of God has plenty of water. It provides a bountiful harvest of grain, for you have ordered it so. I love that phrase, the river of God has plenty of water. See, the river of God is never in lack. And the word for plenty speaks of more than enough. It speaks of an overflow. It speaks of abundance. See, the river of God speaks of his inexhaustless supply, that his exhaustless supply will never run out. So no matter what you face, no matter what you and I walk through, no matter what trial may come, no matter what hardship may come our way, hear me, the river of God shall never run dry. God has a blessing for you. What you and I must do is step into that river and experience the fullness of God, experience the power of the Holy Spirit. You and I, we must believe big during this season. I think the enemy during this COVID-19 is mediocrity. is to become comfortable with where we're at. Church, I think it's important that we believe big, that we believe God to move the mountains of the impossible around us. Tyler Deer in his exhortation talked about being in a valley and sometimes we see the mountains that represent impossibilities and our eye is upon the impossibility instead of the one who's sitting at the table with us. There's a psalm that says, where does my help come from? My help does not come from the mountains. My help comes from the Lord God Almighty. And may this nation remember and may you and I remember today our help comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. And the river of God shall never run dry. You can go to him and there is plenty, always enough. The river of God is always abounding, flourishing, overflowing, and welling up. There is never any lack in God. There is never any insufficiency in God. There is never any deficiency in God. Did you know this? There is never a bad day with God. (laughs) You ever woke up and had a bad day? (laughs) You ever woke up? And realize, oh my word, this is going to be a tough one. You know, God never wakes up. Matter of fact, he never sleeps is what the word tells us. He doesn't slumber. But our God never has a bad day. You know, sometimes I'm not on my best game. Some days, you know, I'm just not have that extra step in my walk. But hear me, every day with the Lord, the blessings of God flow because the river of God never runs dry. My God is enough. So write this under B, trust God for something bigger. Trust God for something bigger. Believe bigger. And then you got to move from just saying it to trusting him for it. You say, well, pastor, you didn't lose your job. I lost mine. Hear me. We all have walked through some dark valleys. We all have experienced some difficult moments. We all have had some setbacks in our life. But you need to trust God in the midst of that setback. You need to trust God in the midst of that drought and realize the river of God is going to come and sustain you and carry you. Trust God for something better. There's a verse found in Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 1. I like to read this out of the King James. It says, cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Cast thy bread upon the waters, for you shall find it after many days. Jim Winter, in his commentary, writes this. Whatever... Picture the preacher is trying to paint for us, 
the moral is the same. Michael Eaton gives us a good summary when he says, cast demands total commitment. To cast demands a forward look to it. See, when you're casting your bread upon the water, you're looking forward. You're not looking back. In church, we cannot pine for yesterday. We cannot pine for yesteryear. We have to have a forward look because I believe there are opportunities before us. There are opportunities before the church. There's opportunities before your family. And God is going to do something great. Dream big. Believe big. And trust for something bigger. And the verse says you will find, meaning a reward which requires patience, you will find after many days. We live in a very instant gratification society. We want what we want when we want it, and we want it like yesterday. So we have a problem with this casting your bread upon the waters, and then after many days because we want God to work at this moment, at this time, today, in this hour, I submit to you that God is working this moment, this hour, but he's going to manifest so your eyes can see in days to come. What you've got to do is keep your heart right. What you have to do is keep your heart pure because God is going to bring that back to you after many days. So the preacher is telling us to step out in faith. Much as Jesus instructed his disciples in Luke 5, verse 4, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. See, our lives should be lived with this kind of boldness. In the face of the grinding reality of life under the sun, may we have a heavenly perspective of a God who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or even think. See, the Christian should be someone who is constantly pushing the boat out, believing for bigger things, believing God to do something when everybody is speaking fear, when everybody is speaking a dark night is coming, when everybody is declaring things are not going to get better for a long time. I believe that we have to believe in the goodness of God and have hope knowing that God is going to work and move by his spirit. F.B. Meyer is quoted as saying, When I trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, I married adventure. And that meant living by faith and expecting the unexpected. Total commitment. Total commitment, casting your bread upon the waters. Total commitment is going after the presence of God. Cast your bread. In other words, hold nothing back. Do not live on reserve. Live in total commitment to the cause of Jesus Christ. It is unreserved abandonment. To cast your bread is to live in faith, trusting for more and leaving the results with God. See, to cast your bread upon the water is to let go of what God has given you at this moment and believing him to do more in the future. Church, I believe it's important that during this season that we, as the people of God, we cast our bread upon the water. We go all in with him, and we say, God, we're believing you for something more. We believe in you for something bigger because we know the river of God never runs dry. We know that you are infinite. You are everlasting. You're the king of kings, and you're the Lord of lords, and we believe for the power of God to be manifested in these trying days. Church, remember, you have married adventure. 
live by faith and expect the unexpected. Believe God for an overflow of his strength, of his power. Believe God for an overflow of his goodness, of his mercies, of his faithfulness. Let's talk secondly about the blessings of the river of God. The blessing. I love Psalm 23. Psalm 23, verse 5, the second part of verse 5 says, My cup overflows with blessings. Some of you remember the old English King James, My cup runneth over. <laughs> Church, when you have the river of God flowing in you and out of you, when you're anticipating the river of God to break forth at any moment, your cup is running over. Your cup is overflowing with the goodness of God. If you feel like you have lack, if you feel like you are, you are deficient, let me encourage you. Find the river of God and step into that river. Seek the presence of God until he comes and reigns in your heart heart and life my cup runneth over let's talk a moment about the new wine let's talk about the spirit of God the promise of the father in the old testament the book of Joel chapter 2 verses 23 through 29 the new living translation says rejoice you people of Jerusalem Rejoice in the Lord your God, for the rain he sends demonstrates his faithfulness. Oh, did you hear that? The rain he sends demonstrates his faithfulness. Once more, the autumn rains will come as well as the rains of spring. The threshing floors will again be piled high with grain, and the presses will overflow Get that, will overflow with new wine and olive oil. The Lord says, I will give you back what you lost in the swarming locust, the hopping locust, the stripping locust, and the cutting locust. Did you get that? I will give you back what the enemy has taken. I will give you back what the enemy has stolen. I will give you back. Church, my God is a God of promise. Promise. My God is a God of faithfulness. And we must be preachers that preach hope to a hurting society. I believe God is going to come and restore righteousness. I believe God is going to come and restore what the enemy has stolen from your life, from your family, from your business, from your workplace. I believe God is going to restore some things for you. It was I who sent this great destroying army against you. Once again, you will have the food you want. And you will praise the Lord your God who does these miracles. Never again will my people be disgraced. Then you will know that I am among my people Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. Never again will my people be disgraced. Verse 28, then, after doing all those things, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. In those days, I will pour out my spirit even on servants, men and women alike. What you notice about the new wine, what you notice about this Pentecost experience, what you notice about what God is doing by pouring his spirit out, it is a, it is a cross-generational move. Sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and young men will see visions. Church, one of the things I love about Glad Tidings is we are a cross-generational church. 
We're not simply a church full of older people seeking God. We are a church full of young people too. We're not simply a church full of 20 and 30 somethings seeking the face of God. We are a church full of baby boomers, Gen Xers, millennials seeking and desiring an overflow of the move of God because we are convinced the river of God shall never run dry. We are a cross-gender move, meaning this, sons and daughters, men and women alike. We are not a church simply filled with women worshiping the Lord. We have a strong representation of men. And the enemy has sold a bill of goods that men do not want spiritual things. But what God is doing at Glad Tidings is a reminder that the move of God takes place in our sons and our daughters. And what I love about this move of God is a cross-cultural move. I will pour my spirit upon all people. All people. We are experiencing today. What we are experiencing today is a move of God among the nations. The nations of the earth are represented here at GT. And we're reminded the move of God is a cross-cultural move. See, the answer to the hate that fills the streets in America is the move of God in our churches. The answer to the division which fills our world is an overflow of the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. And church, we must not be satisfied until the move of God changes attitudes, changes prejudices, and addresses motives. We must not be satisfied for the move of God to stop with our house, us four, and no more. May we long for an overflow for our family, our community, our nation, and our world. Let's spend the last few moments talking about preparing for the overflow. Preparing for the overflow. See, our view of God and worship is so important. Many people are lifting their hands and worshiping a God who's a figment of their imagination. A God who is subservient to their whims, to their desires, to their conveniences, and to their personal thoughts and opinions is not a biblical view of who God is. We must have an accurate biblical view of God. I've spoke about this. I want to remind us We must have a biblical view of what God expects from us. We must be a people of the word and quit being a people of convenience. We must be people of the word and not people of convenience. In the book Evangelicals Then and Now, the author Peter Jeffrey writes this. If we have a small view of God, then inevitably we will have no expectation of God breaking into our lives in power. And if we have no expectation, no expectation produces dry, formal, lifeless Christianity that has a good memory for remembering past blessings but has no vision for present moves of God's Holy Spirit. So church, we must believe big. We must trust God for bigger things. And the only way you're going to trust God for bigger things is if you have a biblical accuracy of who your God is. Because when you see him as the lion of the tribe of Judah, you see him as he who was and is and is to come, the Almighty. Then every time you come together, you come with an expectancy that God just might show up. And if God shows up, then something good is about to happen. Church, I believe for an overflow today. 
In America, we face the reality of a generation that's been raised in the church but does not know the God who is Lord of the church. My prayer today is this. Lord, help us to know you in biblical truth. Help us to worship you as you have revealed yourself in Scripture. Help us to enlarge our spiritual vision to see you in your abundance, in your greatness, in your holiness, in your creativeness. When we see God in these manifestations, we would then expect God to break into the normality of our lives with spectacular power. When we have a correct biblical view of who our God is, we will expect God to do the unexpected. We will expect him to move the mountains. We will expect God to heal the sick, raise the dead, open the blinded eyes, set at liberty the captives, and heal the broken hearted. What seems impossible with us is not impossible with God because the river of God will never run dry. He is the all-sufficient, the almighty, all-encompassing one. He spoke the worlds into existence and he can breathe life back into his church and revival break forth like never before. If you believe it, give God praise. Church, may our view of God expand to the point that we will expect him to move in the miraculous today. How do you prepare for the overflow? We need an intense longing for him. An intense longing for his presence, for his being, for him. We're good at longing for his blessing but are we good at longing for his presence? We're good at longing for what he dispenses, but are we good at longing for him, for who he is? For to experience him is to have his blessings in your life. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, that most famous verse the Apostle Paul uttered, I want to know him and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. We must have an intense longing for the person of God the Father. I want to know him and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. Let me ask a couple of questions. How do you see God? How do you understand God, you personally? Is your view of God biblical? If you say, well, I, I don't know, I, I hope so, fall in love with his word. Fall in love with biblical truth. Fall in love with studying the word of God, and the Father will disclose to you who he is. And there's not a challenge, a difficulty, a heart hardship that you may walk through, that he is not sufficient to help you. The river of God shall never run dry. The river of God has plenty of water. <laughs> you say, well, pastor, I got some pretty big problems. The river of God has plenty of water. In the Old Testament, Exodus Chapter 33, I, I love this picture. You begin reading in verse 7, it says, It was Moses' practice to take the tent of meeting 
and to set it up some distance from the camp, everyone who wanted to make a request to the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent of meeting, all the people would get up and stand at the entrance of their own tents. They would all watch until Moses disappeared inside. Verse 9, as he went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and hover at its entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. When the people saw the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they would stand and bow in front of their own tents. Inside the tent of meeting, where the presence of God was, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face. In the presence, God would speak. Oh, church, we need to hear God today. We don't need to know what the latest political junkie has to say concerning what we're going through. We need to know what God has to say. We need to get into the presence and hear the voice of God. We need to hear the voice of the King of Kings, the Alpha and the Omega, the first, the last, the beginning and the end. We need to hear what he has to say. When Moses went into the tent, the cloud would gather at the entrance and everybody would know God was in the tent of meeting. They would bow at the foot, worshiping toward that tent of tabernacle because they knew the presence of God was communing with the man of God. And church is important. It's important that you and I recognize the cloud. It's important that you and I recognize the Shekinah. It's important that you and I understand the presence of the Lord. And then verse 11 says, Afterward, Moses will return to the camp. But the young man who assisted him, Joshua, would remain behind in the tent of meeting. I wonder, are there some Joshuas here today who will say, I'll stay in the tent of meeting until the Lord shows up and I experience the afterglow.